So we are going to start. Maybe we can close the door. If someone at the back of the room can please go and close the doors. So this is the sixth-ish meeting. For those people who want to listen to BGP, that's the wrong room. And this is the new, uh, not well, uh, so it's, it's kind of the same as usual. So you need to remember that if something is being discussed and you're aware about IPR, you need to please let us know or tell the chairs after the meeting. And then please go through this slide. I won't spend the time, but um, all the contributions to the ITF, including this, what is being said in this meeting and on the mailing list, uh, must follow the, the rules. In RFC 5378 and RFC 8179, please, if you're not too sure, go and read those RFCs. Um, this is a official meeting. Uh, minutes will be taken. We have uh, two minute takers. Thank you, guys, uh, and and two uh, helpers on the Jabber as well. We are taking the minutes on the fly on Etherpad. So uh, there is a uh, on the data tracker agenda there are a number of buttons associated to the meeting and one of those buttons give you direct access to the etherpad otherwise the link is written on the bottom of the slides here so if you can please go to etherpad and uh, if, if you said something for instance you may uh, validate that the minutes are taken correctly and reflect what you intended to say okay or if you want to participate to the minute taking that's highly appreciated so we go through the agenda We've got quite a full agenda today. Um, so we will be giving a summary of uh, the F, F and TROP test, which happened uh, Friday and Saturday, and uh, the, the Akathon activity as well. Then we go through uh, the almost complete uh, items which relate to scheduling. So the scheduling function, sorry for the typo here, scheduling function zero and the six stop protocol. And then we'll dig into the uh, security work. So there will be two main items. There will be Malisha talking about the minimal security, which is um, a mostly done piece of work. And then Michael will come and present to us the, the status of the design team. And maybe if you can address a little bit the three drafts here, uh, Michael. And then time permitting, so we'll use the rest of our time for uh, those, those uh, drafts. So we've got a new scheduling function that uh, Simon's going to present us. Then uh, Jonathan will talk about the, exa the 60 example. Georgios will talk about uh, replication and elimination. So that's a technique that's being discussed at DeathNet, and this draft uh, shows how we can apply it on 60 and then Lijo will, Lijo will uh, talk about uh, an expression, expression time, which is an activity that is uh, happening at six low, but he will be giving us a uh, short summary of what's, what's going on there. And Bob, since you're here, I dare to ask, but we have an AOB. Bob, Bob Bailey, please. We, we've got some AOB, AOB time. I was just wondering if you could please, during the AOB, come up and tell us a little bit about what's happening at the IEEE these days. Oh. <laughs> Thanks so much. It's a big surprise, right? OK, so um, with this, so uh, confirm that there are not takers are in the room. So Dominique, I don't see you. Oh, oh yes, I see you now. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> and Francesca, Francesca, Fra yes, so perfect. Michael, I heard you. Ines, I think I see you on the side. OK, so there we go. We are ready to start. And we'll start with uh, two announcements. So we have two RFCs. One of them comes out of this group. I don't know that it's very, very related. 
So the first one is uh, thanks to Tero, thanks Tero for doing this work. Now we've got a uh, IETF information element that is uh, officially ours from the from the IEEE. ID, and ID five, right? Implementers, IETF, I, IEEE ID IE five. And 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 last but not least, uh, congratulations to the authors, in particular Chavi, who did the bulk of the edition. We now have the, the RFC number for the minimal uh, support for 60, so that's really the, the core uh, result of this working group so far. And, and, okay, and now if we look at our milestones, and it's good that Suresh is with us, um, there is an interesting thing is we did not update the milestone to reflect the security work, so we really need to, to work on that. Uh, apart from that, yes? So yeah, go ahead and do it, and I'll approve uh, whenever it comes through. Okay. Uh, Suresh Krishnan for the minutes. And then we are a little bit late, but not that late. Uh, so we will discuss about the six-star protocol, whether we, we are ready for last call. It appears that we are, from my initial reading of the test that we ran last week. Uh, SF0, we'll discuss as well, knowing that we are running for experimental for that one. And uh, then we'll, we'll be talking about what we do for the security, and what we put in the milestones. Okay, and soon enough, now we'll, be, we'll have to decide what we do after the security work. So maybe if we have time at the end in the AOB, we can start thinking about what's next for this group. And with this, Margarita, I will give you the floor. So no surprise, but laser more. And presenters, if you can please always stay here because you're on TV, right? So I'm uh, glad to uh, report about the first F interop six -ish interoperability event that we have run on Friday and Saturday, 14, 15 uh, July. This uh, event has been uh, organized by ETSI. And you should be able to see your slides in the monitor no, there. No, it doesn't, doesn't work. work? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. If somebody knows how to switch on this monitor, <laughs> it be is fun. black. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I was saying it has been organized by ETC and uh, LIS, and um, it has been founded by the European Commission through the open call of uh, NH 2020 project called the F Interop. Uh, as usual, we had the support of two companies, OpenMode for the hardware and OpenWSN for the firmware. This time, we had uh, quite a, a nine number of participating companies, 16, and uh, we had uh, also several implementations. In particular, we had five different implementations for Sixtish and uh, six for uh, OSCOAP. So for giving you an idea of the people that organized and made the, the event, here is a picture of us. So all the people that uh, came and uh, we thank uh, them for coming with their own implementation. And of course, we were not only people there, but as you can see, there were uh, many things that we try to connect and to let them work uh, together. Uh, just a, a brief overview of uh, how the event was organized. Of course, uh, we got this uh, grant for the open call of the F Interop, and it was mainly LIST and C taking care of this, and we organized a first uh, meeting, a WebEx, beginning of July for a meeting uh, with the company and discuss about the test description. We had the test description that was prepared uh, with the app of Tengfame, Alicia, and uh, at the same time, uh, there were some tests prepared also for uh, OSCOAP and it was led by Francesca Palombini. And um, as I said, the event is organized in the context of F Interop, and so Remy helped for the preparation of some uh, six-ish uh, online tool, and I will talk more about this afterward. About the test that we wanted to run for this uh, edition, we focus mainly on uh, synchronization, minimal, because now it is RFC, we wanted to check if it works. And then six, uh, six stop also, and uh, finally some security aspect, both uh, uh, at uh, uh, link layer and uh, other related more to the joining uh, function. So overall, as you can see, 
you know, we had uh, 16 tests for 6P, we checked uh, several uh, um, commands like add, list, count, and uh, for minimal we checked the format of the NIS beacon, the setup of the channel uh, hopping, the throat frame uh, size. And, uh, okay, for, uh, as I said, the uh, event uh, ran for uh, one day and thus we have an initial setup phase as usual and then three main test uh, sessions. And uh, on uh, Friday, on Saturday, after uh, everything was uh, concluded, we had the final uh, wrap-up uh, session. This is for giving you an idea of uh, the fun that we had. So as you can see, there was, uh, 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 we were happy to test the different implementation with many devices connected. Again, we had, as usual, the Wireshark detector that, uh, that tests a lot. And we gave uh, a demo session on uh, F Interop, how to use the online tool. Margarita, yes. these pictures. So thank you for putting those because last time we put pictures which involved mostly wires and people were asking whether this was a wireless event. So you see, we tried to put I, antennas I, I took, this time. I took care of so, all the all right. uh, aspects, people, device, uh, thank and you. Uh, detector. Thank you. There's no power cable, it's all wireless. I was careful. <laughs> thank you. And uh, okay, also showing happy people because this is an happy <laughs> event. We were uh, happy to, to test and validate the interoperability. Uh, once we, we finished the test, uh, all the company involved were able to report the results of the test using uh, a TFT tool provided by Etsy. And uh, this is uh, very efficient. It allows us to record and uh, then compute easily the, the statistic. Here are the results, as you can see, it was a great success. We had almost 86% of the tests uh, passed, and uh, uh, there were a few tests that were not uh, applicable, mainly those related to, to security, and uh, in particular, all the success one confirmed that the RFC 8180, so minimal, is uh, working and interoperately properly among the different five implementations, so this was uh, great. Yes. So, Thomas, can you go back to the previous slide? So, yes. to be uh, to be very very clear, uh, we try to not cheat um, uh, because when so <laughs> let me explain. <laughs> 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 what should I say? What did I say? No, what we do is last time uh, we didn't kind of enforce this rule, and if you do a test and it passes, you're very happy to click red or green. If it doesn't work or you 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 kind of don't click red. So last time we had 100% uh, um, uh, passing tests. What we did now is we enforce the rule. Okay, look, if you if you try a test, then you have to say pass or fail. If it's fail, it doesn't matter. And if you come with an implementation which did not implement that feature, and that we had you know eleven different implementations, so it's normal that not every implementation gets that feature. Please press not applicable. So the gray part here is the kind of gives you an idea of the percentage of what was implemented from the things. And so I think this is a very very positive number. Uh, you know, uh, two thirds of everything that we've written was implemented by the different implementations, which is very cool. And from those implementations, 86% of those passed. So it was a, it was a, a fun event. So, uh, as I said, this um, uh, plug test was organized and founded in the context of the F Interop European project. And uh, for those that are not familiar, this is an European project that aims to develop uh, some online testing tool that are available on uh, a shared platform. And the uh, aim is to be able to run interoperability uh, tests while staying uh, in, uh, uh, in uh, without the need of being all uh, in the same place. So the idea is that you can be in your office, you can have your hardware there, and through an agent you connect remotely to this platform and to the testing tool that are available on the internet. Right now, there is a quite a big number of tests that the platform already provide, or anyway will provide in short uh, term, like six, Fishco app, six, Lora, or Oscoap, 
and uh, of course the uh, it would be great if you also contribute to the project and you add your own test you come with your proposition and uh, this platform should be widely used and uh, will somehow become the instrument for uh, running interoperability event uh, more often without the need of travel and cutting uh, costs so during uh, the uh, plug test we uh, show with uh, a, a day more how this uh, platform can be used for running, for example, ripple test. And uh, the idea is that uh, in the next event, we will uh, actually use some of these uh, online uh, uh, tests for, uh, for uh, our uh, 60 plug test. So just for giving the feedback of the event, as I said already before, it was a great success. We had a very high percentage of uh, successful tests, in particular for uh, the minimal uh, now RFC 8180, all the implementation uh, were working well. And then for uh, six stop, we had the chance to identify little detail that it would be better to fix uh, and, uh, in the next uh, draft. In particular for the add command, in the current version, we uh, usually uh, um, reply with the uh, uh, success code with the empty cell list when we don't have uh, any more cell available to be reserved. But uh, actually, we realize it will be better to use a no response code still with empty cell list. And then in case of generation mismatch, right now in the draft, we are recommending to send a clear uh, yes. Uh, I think I have a question here. State because, your name, please. Uh, I'm Tong Fei Chang from Inria. Uh, recording to the add command, if there's uh, no available one, uh, you return no resource. But for me, no resource is uh, kind of I scatter something, but you don't have more buffer for the slot rather than this. So uh, I think, Chavi, you, you're going to present this, and you have this list as well. So yeah. Tengfei, keep okay. the thought. I think it, we it should discuss uh, a okay. fight with Charlie. Okay. When okay. You present the six yeah. okay. Thank you. And the same for the generation mismatch. We are right now suggesting to send a clear, but it will be better to add a, a rollback policy. So these uh, are all feedback that afterward uh, Chavi will discuss. So uh, what we can say, again, it was a, a good uh, success uh, and uh, we could uh, um, actually see that uh, there was interoperability, that uh, the drafts are uh, at a good state of uh, maturity and uh, as usual the event helped in uh, progressing and uh, um, have a feeling of uh, how um, uh, the technology is now well implemented uh, and uh, uh, it works. Uh, so about next event, as I said, the, the aim is to use the online testing tool and uh, to have a remote e event. We, we will fix a date. We didn't decide yet. This will be advertised in uh, advance. Of course, feedback are, uh, will come. By that uh, time, for sure, the tool will be available. The event will be still organized in the context of uh, the FinTerop uh, project. And uh, we will make sure that uh, there is enough information to know how to use uh, the testing tool. Right now, you can already log and try to use uh, uh, the, this tool. There uh, is al there also a feedback uh, uh, link, so you can provide suggestions how to improve and to make them better. So um, I want I want to stress how cool this is. Well, right, we 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 tested everything from synchronizing 15.4, 15.4e, um, secure joining, um, and then scheduling function. Uh, sorry, uh, six star protocol to schedule different nodes. So this is you know where we're almost almost there. So it's very cool to have seen this. If you have any um, I suggestions or comments about the event that we wouldn't. Do in the fall. Um, please let let us know if you have any days that work or don't work for you. One idea that has been floated is to have a an event uh, again in a physical room with, with participants that are remote. So of course Singapore might be um, you know a right right uh, time frame for that. So if you have any uh, any comments, please let us know. Thank you. Thank you, Marita.
<laughs> so, uh, think, Faye, there you are. Um, you, left and right button. Uh, uh, so this is the uh, hack zone happening on Sunday, uh, July 16, right uh, after the black test. And uh, the same participants um, in the black test joined the, this uh, hack zone event. And the goal is to go up, uh, you can find in the link and uh, you can also uh, check here. Uh, so here is our outcome from the hack zone event. Uh, there are four items. Um, the one is an integrator of open Robinson stack in Red. Uh, with that, uh, during the hack song, um, we are uh, doing the adaptation of the Red hardware uh, uh, driver code, uh, and also create an open w open Robinson stack and uh, um, use the tool for integrating with uh, Red. Uh, so with this. Uh, 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 Integration uh, complete uh, and open option now it can support uh, all the major open source uh, implementations. Uh, and during the hackathon, we also pr uh, presented a feature of a platform and we have some prog uh, progress. Uh, uh, by up updating the bootstrap uh, of the test session of the feature of a platform, um, it's more like flashing the hardware control remotely uh, the testing device before. Um, the users really do the test, uh, the finger, the finger up uh, test before. Um, so also we have progress on the drone security. Um, we, we're refactoring the the GRC code, uh, and also uh, the key for the network it can be generated at the random right time uh, when the open visualizer is in initialized. Uh, this means when we can start the different network and uh, with the different uh, network key, so they won't uh, influence uh, each other. So with this and uh, the full safety uh, uh, and uh, all the, with uh, the security bootstraps now is uh, in the Open uh project. Uh, and on the Open Doublestone side, uh, we also do the housekeeping uh, and fixing and cleaning up some uh, of the project uh, related to the. Uh, open mode and the test be uh, platform, um, and also complete uh, the design of a commission, which is the one touch security uh, through the uh, Navi param, param module. Uh, and also, uh, we fixed uh, some bug from the repo. Uh, we added uh, the PIO and uh, some configuration option uh, in the uh, repo DIO packet and it's referring to the RFC uh, 6450. Uh, and with this, uh, the full open and Kondiki can be interrupted. Um, thank you, these were announcements. Um, thank you, thank you. Sure. Okay, so now let's uh, move to the uh, first um, section about dynamic scheduling, so I think if I remember correctly, yes, Chavi, you're, you're up. Give us an up update about the six stop protocol. Okay, hi everybody. I'm presenting an update of the six stitch protocol. We are um, in version seven. Uh, the last update was last 27th of June. This draft is pretty stable. There's uh, several implementations of it, completely independent implementations supported in, in vendor uh, platforms and also in, in open source platforms. Um, we, we've test some of these implementations, five different implementations on the 60s uh, black test, on the Etsy black test last, last Friday and Saturday. And uh, my goal today is uh, just summarize what we've been doing in the last in the last month and maybe ask for the work group last last call. So uh, during the last uh, month, we've been updating some minor uh, problems that were reported by different reviewers. Jonathan and, and Charlie sent us a very exhaustive list of comments. We addressed all of them. We posted the responses to the mailing list. Um, 
uh, we fixed some minor things in some typos and errors. And uh, we did some reordering of sections to make it more clear and maybe remove some, some text that was kind of uh, not, not important or like repeated. And what at we are now, this is the status that we are now on after the, the black test, we have identified a couple of things that we want to comment and we want to see maybe your, your opinion or if you can give your, your point in, in either here or in the mailing list. One point is um, when we do a 6p add, the 6p add command always returns a success. And depending on, on the outcome of the add, of the add command, it it responds a list of the cells that have been allocated. For example, if I issue an ad and I want two cells and both of them are allocated, the response contains, it, it says success, plus in the list of cells that it returns, there are these two cells. This is full allocation. If I, if I issue an ad, but the receiver cannot allocate both of them, but only one, it returns that cell. So I know it's success and I allocated only one cell. And if it, uh, if it, none of them can be allocated, then it returns success. This is the current thing now, but the list is empty. So there are some complaints on the implementation saying, okay, but I need to look at the list and I know because of the size of the list is zero that I couldn't allocate them. But this is a kind of a strange case because you are saying success, but you cannot allocate any. So the concern here is whether we have to use no rest uh, response instead of or only or another another code as 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 you indicated ten fate so that's one one of the possible things that we can improve I don't know if there's any comment on this so this is Tom Fei from uh, in Ria. so uh, the here is uh, the no racers for me as the beginning is saying uh, if I reserve a cell like a five um, maybe five is not occupied, but uh, my slot buffer is is already full, and I can also reserve you more. So that case uh, return no resource. So, but this case is different from that. So maybe there will be a, another a return code for this. Okay, so you propose to have another uh, an, an additional return code for for, for this, this case. case? Yes. Okay, if we so. Thomas, so if we uh, add an extra return code for saying we have no space at all, I'm sorry, no, 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 a return code for saying none of those cells in your in your cell list uh, satisfies us, we might as well add another return code for, a, for the insane partial, because I think we try to, I mean, the proposal of no res is to be able to re reuse its return code, so we might as well make some specific return codes. It's, uh, we have one byte for the return code, and we currently have like five allocated, right? So we have 256. That we no, can I, I don't see any problem on allocating a couple more. And okay. If we can make it more explicit even because someone detects that there's error codes that are ambiguous, we can make them more more okay. kind of specific. That's that's fine. So Would that work for you, Tinkay? Yeah. yeah. He says yes. Pascal Tuber here. Um, if you make a new return code, you need to have a behavior associated to it, which is specific to this return code. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, this is another point. Um, when, um, when for some reason uh, uh, a generation error is detected, you know, when we uh, maybe allocate cells and for some reason we lose an act and then one side of the, of the allocation fails and one side allocates the cells but the other one not, we have an inconsistency in the schedule. So uh, in this case, um, in the current version, we recommend that when this inconsistency is detected, we just, we recommend, it's not mandatory, but we recommend to clear the schedule. Clearing the schedule can be very costly because, and, and it's costly if we take into account that maybe we'll lose only one or two, uh, two acts. So the proposal here is that to introduce a mechanism or change a little bit the behavior so we can try to correct that uh, situation. Because we know that if we detect that inconsistency, it's due to the last operation we have, did, we have done. It cannot be due to any other thing. It only can happen because the previous operation we did uh, messed up, or we lost an act, or we lost a packet, and once one of the sites did, did not uh, 
detect that. So what we propose uh, to cope with the situation and enable, and this will be policy, so we don't say how, but we enable a policy to correct that problem is change a little bit the text uh, on, on correcting uh, or, or coping with generation errors and saying that um, when, uh, we have the, when we detect this error, you cannot add or you cannot delete cells. You, well, you, you, you cannot uh, add or delete cells, but you can still, the, the list and count operations will work. Will, you will be able to send a list and count to the, your neighbor, and then uh, the return of this, of this operation will tell you what's happening, and then you can correct your own schedule with this result. And then you can then tweet, kind of cheat on the generation number and then stay in sync again. So that's our proposal. And the text we propose is the one in the middle, the, the two bullets, the first one and the last one are already in the draft. And, and the one in the middle is uh, if the code of the 6P request is count or list, when I detected that generation error, the node must execute the operation and return the requested values. And this can be used. Uh, despite of we have the generation error to correct the inconsistency. So that's what we propose. We don't say how, but we say we support that by listing and counting, we, we can detect the difference in the schedule and then correct it. Do we have any comments from implementers about this? Or I think it... Yeah, maybe that. This is uh, Yasu Tanaka from Toshio. Uh, actually, the, the generation, generation management the works very well. The actually too well. So we that that time we just only thing that uh, to issue the clear. So my proposal is maybe sound a little bit radical. Just throw away the, the general generation management. So both peers can detect the the last transaction fails or not so it should the timeout should occur when for example when the the peer cannot receive the the mac act or something it can be detect, detected and also the count or list the the command also the the give your more information to how can i say to get back mm -hmm. the, the the step the single the same schedule the mm -hmm. the sales so again my proposal is throw away the the general management that's but, I, I think that's easier but the huge impact on the, the drop mm -hmm. the thing is uh, if you if you drop this mechanism you are forced somehow uh, periodically maybe to issue lists or counts to in order to see if everything is is correct which I, I think uh, this is safer in terms mm -hmm. of consistency because at the first action you do, you detect the inconsistency, then you can react quickly. If not, you can like diverge. Yeah, m my point is the timeout could be uh, used for, uh, I don't know, more, yeah. To, to, force, the, to yeah. force the list, so if timeout, I force the list, so, so Thomas, I have a, I have a counter example, and this is the reason why we put the, 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 the counter in there, generation. The problem, you know, yes, with Mac acts and all of that, you can detect that something went wrong in communication. The only case you cannot detect is when an act is lost. So you try, you send me a, a, a response, I send you an act, but you don't get the act. Uh, and this is your last retry, Mac layer retry. So I think everything's fine, and you say that you think the whole transaction has failed. So now what happens? You, your, my generation has bumped. Your generation has not bumped. And so that's the inconsistency. I think we want to detect with that with that mechanism. Is that uh, you, you say yes? So I, I assume this case is you fully have thought of this, but you still don't agree. And also, I detect the timeout. Because I didn't receive your act. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I didn't understand. <laughs> let's. So let's. Uh, I think it's. We we have too little time to discuss this. Let's maybe have a, a little chat over the over the week, and if not uh, during the during the during the 
on the mailing list to 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 make it this clear okay yeah so it's my last slide um the next steps um there's there's a little thing i want to do and it's to clarify the use of the itfie in the draft I, now it's just a very a very simple sentence i went to, i want to clarify how this ie is used how it's encapsulated will be just one more line explaining how to use it and then resolve all, all these two plug test outcome um, issues or problems that we have identified and then i'm asking for a work group last call uh, sorry i wasn't paying attention so um uh so i think the changes are that we have identified we have to have this discussion for sure first um the the, the draft has been implemented many times it, it works well i think we're very very close to having a final version i think uh, we need to uh, resolve the plug set outcomes maybe uh, bump the ver revision publish this and then i propose that we have a work group last call at on the mailing list right after this uh, 008 is published does that work okay yeah I, w I would like to add that, uh, as you know, this uh, draft uses uh, information element three happening at the Mac layer, and uh, that the IEEE is very, very aware that we are doing this, and they have created a working um, uh, task group, the 1512, which is the equivalent of our working groups, which deals with the link layer communications, it's an NLC, and they are integrating the concept of 6P as part of their design already. So they, they, they know it exists, they, they included it in their design, and I hope that Charlie is here at the end of the room. Charlie, Charlie, can you help me? So, so I hope maybe Charlie, you can tell us a little bit more, not now, but at the end of the meeting during the AOB, if you can just tell us a little bit about the 1512, and maybe Bob will tell us more about what's happened, happening globally in 15.4. But I'm just saying that NLC is there and it's wrapping this, this uh, operation nicely. So be, be prepared for questions during the AOB. Microphone, please. I'm, I'm just saying, if you can, during the AOB, talk a little bit about 1512 and how that relates to this work. Well, I just came to the microphone to say that I didn't have anything to say. Um, <laughs> so uh, hopefully later this week I'll, I'll do that. And uh, all right, thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Let's not all follow that. <laughs> that pattern. Uh, any, any more questions for uh, Chavi before we move on? Diego, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, this is Diego Ducomne from Universidad Diego Portales. I'm the editor of uh, the uh, ITF 66, SF0. Uh, this is version five we have published recently. So um, the idea of this draft was to, be, to build a dynamic and distributed, uh, this doesn't work anymore. Okay, <laughs> dynamic and distributed scheduling function. It's not and six dish. It's, it's, well, it's what, okay. And uh, now we have done, done a lot of revision from, from the comments. And thank you. I would like to thank Xavi and Chav and, and thank Chin, uh, uh, who have made a very detailed revision of, of the draft. So I, have, I had some time to address every other comment. So there's a lot of tickets we have, uh, have addressed with. We have also uh, have address in that. So the next question, um, uh, let's see what happens. Okay. Ah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Frozen. Yeah, again. No, don't worry. <laughs> then, um, well, I have a collection of, 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 of typos. So I have solved every other typo, OK? And every other problems we have, so some expressions extra in, and extra text that shouldn't be there. So those are uh, all the details are on the tickets if you want to see them exactly. So uh, I, I just focus on the specific tickets where we to the concepts and mechanisms that were defined on the SF0. And uh, and some movement and big movements of, of text between them. So the first test ticket was uh, 67, which transferred the um, 
some a couple of sections, okay, so says estimation algorithm allocation policy, which were concentrated on the introduction mainly, and just transfer to their specific sections of that to explain a little bit what was going on or what were the original ideas that were uh, generated there. Second and uh, um, 68, um, what's the difference between uh, uh, allocated and used cells, meaning that allocated or scheduled cells, I think we are, we are trying to measure how many cells uh, we are using from the ones which are already uh, scheduled. And this is kind of a, where, uh, how to measure the buffer usage of that. And this is the only point we can sense uh, that there's a change and that we need to uh, react to that change. So uh, that's why so I, I added a definition, a specific definition fit. And then uh, the difference is, is taken from one uh, slot frame to the next one. So we react in, the, in one slot frame time. See, so and we have uh, and we have to uh, to clarify that we only work on um, transmission cells, TX cells from one neighbor to the other. This is a neighbor to neighbor algorithm only. Then um, we are going through to the over provisioning. Okay, and there, there, there's a definition. Uh, there's a clear definition of what over provisioning is, and the thing is we have added a. Uh, this definition in order to 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 specify that we have a specific size of, of the of the number of allocated cells and we need always a little bit more of cells to detect that we are we need more uh, more space and we need more space to, to satisfy a new request in the future and so there's we are artificially allocating more cells okay we are using more that way what we need in order to detect if there's if there's a, a new requirement if uh, we were the Latin sex, with that, that that these cells were less, okay, there's no problem about it, okay. So we 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 are we're going to detect it anyway. But we want to detect more cells are required, okay. This is what the problem we wanted to address on this time. Then uh, about the relocation, okay. Uh, there's another one of the mechanisms that is, that S S zero also also addresses is the relocation of cells. So. Um, Location is clearly defined on, on the for, uh, 433 uh, section of the 6P draft. So which is the mechanism it should, uh, it should force of there. And uh, it only decides when, okay, SF0 only decides when the cell should be relocated according to the packet delivery rate value. So we measure the whole, the, the, the average packet delivery rate of the whole scale that we, are, we have control on, okay, the, and there could be any many uh, scheduling functions working, so the one, the part which, which uh, is, uh, belongs to this scheduling function, we calculate the average, and then we compare each of the uh, cells we are using, okay, um, if there's uh, an increase or decrease after a specific threshold. And, uh, well, and of course we are selected randomly. We are going to willing to keep this very simple. So that, that's why we're main, there are many things where kept random uh, within the, uh, the the selection is just kept random here. There's no specific criteria how to define which cells are going to relocate use. And uh, there are no retransmissions. Again, okay, we react only if if the if the tra transaction was unsuccessful. We only retry afterwards because the requirement still exists. So there, in order to keep it simple, okay, again, we don't use retransmissions. Uh, we have kept only one trigger event. So any change in the number of cells, of use cells, in fact, uh, is going to trigger this scheduling function, and that's that. And uh, of course, the, the cell estimation algorithm works again against a specific neighbor. Okay, so we have a, a have tra we have we track here the number of cells which are scaled to each of the neighbors and the number of use cells against each of the neighbors. So, uh, in case there this, uh, there's a change between one slot frame and the next one, we detect it and react accordingly. So uh, we were asked also to to add a, a diagram how it works. So there's a trigger event over there. So we collect the number of cells to understand which are the number of cells. Or which is the number of cells, in fact, that we are willing to use. Um, we add the overprovision value in order to detect in the future if you need more of cells or not. And, uh, and then the, we pass this value to the allocation policy as for the required cells uh, value. So uh, what happens, our question was, what happens when the overprovision uh, is zero, for example? Say, we, we, if the provision is zero, we cannot detect if there are any more use cells 
Okay, if you are requiring, if, if the, and possibly that will, that will generate a, a packet loss in the queue. So that's one of the, of the, of the problems of, uh, of using an over provision of zero. So we just add a fixed value of over provision, which is implementation specific. And yes, then the, there's all, there are two thresholds here. There are, well, the two values, in fact, not thresholds. The over provision and SF0 threshold. And there's no relationship whatsoever between them. We try to keep the both the self estimation algorithm and the, uh, and the allocation policy independent between them. So even though the, the, within the whole mechanism, there, there may be, a, 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 you can establish a relationship between them at the beginning, or uh, we, we don't uh, define any, uh, any relationship between them. So there's a real provision and there will be a threshold that they design when we are going to change or to add more cells. Mm -hmm. Well, this, the allocation policy, this is the one defines how many and the other decides, decides when to, to make the change. So uh, about the cell list error handling, so F0 does not handle those errors, meaning that uh, we only, if, if, we are, if there's the only handle that we are doing, okay, if there's, there is unsuccessful, we try again because the requirement still exists. And the cells, of course, are randomly chosen. Sorry. Um, well, the array timeout, timeout value, which was discussed in the previous uh, draft, uh, we have the we have defined a per transaction timeout value because we are required to as a, as a scheduling function. However, okay, there there was there's still under discussion apparently that the, if the timeout value should belong to one side or to the other. And the packet delivery rate definition. There was no definitions at the beginning of how to measure the packet delivery rate, so it's calculated per cell, okay, as a percentage of the number of acknowledged packets, okay, as a successful acknowledgement, of course, and uh, out of ten. That is the only fixed value within the whole draft. And there's no transmission, of course, there, as, as I mentioned before. Finally, uh, I think it's finally, I hope, uh, the location uh, policy mechanism, the, um, the initial value of scheduled cells is implementation specific. Then uh, at least a SF0 threshold number of cells must be allocated to each of the neighbors, meaning that this is the, the initial value that we're, we didn't define in the meaning, in the beginning, at the, sorry, at the beginning, and we should be defining in order to start this and to bootstrap the, the process. So the, we need at least to, to, to have this number of cells to start the process. And oops, and finally, if you have any questions about this. Thank you. So I, I have a question for yes. uh, the implementers in the room. Um, who has this implemented? Which implementations do have this uh, SF0? I think, I think you have it. Does con mm -hmm. oh. We have that before, but it's not this version. Not the version, OK. Do, who has any version of SF0 implemented? This is Yasif Tanaka, the portal. Yeah. yeah. I implement this one. But uh, okay. I think the, the previous, I think the last. Yes. Or last one or something, the base on the Conti key. OK. OK. Yeah. So there, there are two implementations in, in the room that have SF0. Mm. And, and have, has anybody um, deployed this at scale? And you know, not just three nodes on a desk, but but deployed is at scale and verified or measured how how good this works. No, no okay, mm -hmm. so there's there's no answer. So I think I think Diego, per our discussion, you know, yeah. last IETF as well. Yes, I mean these edit what you presented are editorial changes, mm -hmm. making things clearer, and we can keep doing this for IETF after IETF Ever. after IETF, mm -hmm. right? What is needed is is you know. I, I'm I'm a company and I look at this and I say you know I have a smart this a smart that application. Um, is SF zero going to be good enough? I mean, how much you know? If I switch on my nodes, how long will they take to join? If mm -hmm. I send a packet, what's the average max min max mm -hmm. latency? How much data? We, we need that kind of results. Yeah. Um, you know, especially because this is zero. So this is mm -hmm. the this is the default one, mm -hmm. uh, so we want to be it to be good enough. So I, you know, again, uh, we need evaluation. So, so it's good. It's good that there are implementations, but 
there needs to be effort and as editor i mean i understand that you might not be i mean or you might but if you're not the one i, I you know go go find people who who will deploy this uh, either in simulation or i mean we need we need results yeah Pascal, I, I think we need to advertise that because there is a, a large component of, of research which yeah. can actually be associated to this work. This is kind of a base um, upon which a lot of research can happen. I mean, where do the cells come from? How mm. do we get non-interfering uh, in cells mm. that can be allocated by different routers? Mm. Uh, how do we avoid oscillations uh, right. in the allocation and the allocation? It would be stupid to p spend our time in 6P allocating mm. and deallocating yeah. things. So I know you get mm. some thresholds there. How do you set them? Um, and, and last time, we, we had that discussion about the opportunity to make this an experimental RFC. And I like this idea because now we have, we have written to the world, hey, there is a base on which we would like you to build. There is what we would like you to experiment with and build a part. If we don't publish it, then people will say, okay, there is this thing, but I don't know where it is, I don't know what state it is, etc., etc. So there's there's a time where we're happy enough to kind of cast in stone that okay, it's not a standard track document, but at least it's the base on which we want to work. And mm -hmm. um, I I had them the impression that last time that's pretty much where we were with the idea of publishing this as experimental. Now if you care about the name SF0 looking like the that's, wow, that, that's it. Yeah, Thomas, this, then, is, then this is my problem. Yeah. Side of that could be to rename it. Mm -hmm. But having publishing this this base, uh, let, let's let's use that as the, as the base of the work about you mm. know how we make those decisions of allocation and deallocation. I think we need it. I think it's it's good to to throw that at you know academia and say, hey, all those points are fantastic research. Please help. Mm -hmm. So, um, Thomas, you know, this is a discussion we need to have, Pascal, of course. Uh, I have a I have a problem having the zero SF being experimental. I mean, what message does this send out? I, yeah, th this is a you know uh, all the work we do here is is you know is for industrial critical mm -hmm. .net kind of things, and having the default one be experimental uh, you know doesn't mm -hmm. send out the right message. Yeah. yeah. So Suresh, you had some some input, Xavi. I, I see you're in. Yeah, Xavi, let's, let's, let's wait for. for should I first? Sorry, did you have it? No? Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so just another point to add. Um, it would be good to evaluate the interaction of SF with 6P because 6P mm -hmm. has a delay on the allocation and yeah. you have to take into account that while you ask for, it takes some time to get it mm -hmm. and maybe what you ask it doesn't make sense. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a relation that's... That, that needs to be mm -hmm. taken into account. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Suresh Krishnan. So, uh, if not this, then what, right? So, what becomes as a zero? So, like, we have, do we have something in play? I don't know, right? Like, so think of that first thing. Mm -hmm. uh, second mm -hmm. thing is, like, if you want to make this experimental, that's okay. But um, I would like to see what the experiment is, right? Yeah. So, like, what are you actually trying to collect? Like, the draft doesn't have anything like that. So, like, mm -hmm. just putting something in experimental, like previously, mm -hmm. like a couple of years ago, used to be a way of lowering the bar of review, saying, like, oh, this is experimental. Like, you know, people, take a lighter read of the draft, right, in the IESG and everything. But I, I think it's more valuable to actually document what is the experiment, what are you going to collect, and mm -hmm. like what are you going to do with it, right? And if you decide to go the experimental path, and I will support it, um, just make sure that, like, you know, what do you want to figure out? Like, you know, like you, what are the things you want to collect and how you want to bring it back to standards track in the future. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Suresh. There are, there are other SFs uh, in, in being developed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any more questions for Diego? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Diego. So this brings us to the um, other so uh, part, which is not dynamic, dynamic scheduling, which is the work on security. Uh, and you have two uh, two, theme, two things to talk about. First, minimal security. And then Richard, uh, Michael will, will come in with uh, the second draft. Go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. My name is oh, my name is Malisha. I'm the editor of the minimal security draft, which is the one-touch procedure for secure enrollment in six dish networks. Uh, yeah. 
So we published the 003 version on June 15th, uh, and I was mostly busy with the implementation efforts in OpenWSN. And the good news is that we have, uh, an, uh, as Tank Face said, we had, we have an, uh, an implementation complete in OpenWSN environment, and an on ongoing implementation in Contiki based on pre-shared keys. Uh, I will go through the summary of updates uh, that we did in the O3 since the last ITF, and then I will show some of the updates that I did uh, that I intend to do based on the implementation experience. Uh, so first, there was a couple of uh, there was a couple of exchanges on the mailing list regarding the communication, how communication proceeds during the joint process. So I wanted to clarify this, and I will make an attempt to clarify it in the draft. Uh, basically, we have a pledge, which is, or in all terminology, the joining node, uh, which uh, is pre-configured with uh, locally relevant credentials, such as a pre-shared key or a locally relevant uh, certificate. Uh, we have uh, a one, one hop uh, radio neighbor of the pledge that we term as joint proxy, and uh, the joint registrar and the coordinator, which is the central entity that manages the joint process. The pledge and the joint proxy communicate over link local addresses. And this will be important for the later slides, is to note that pledge only needs to know the address of the joint proxy. The joint proxy, however, needs to know the address of the JRC. And there was one issue that I will discuss later, how JRC finds out the, the address of, uh, how joint proxy finds out the address of the JRC. The path from the pledge to the joint proxy is, lay, is insecure in what concerns layer two security, and it passes over secure, uh, and, it, uh, and the path from joint proxy to the JRC is the mesh part that is secured, layer two secure uh, 15.4. This is Thomas. Um, want to clarify? It says insecure, layer two insecurity, but there's an end, right? Can yes, you yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So it's it, layer it two insecure, so it's clear. Uh, the frames are sent in clear on layer two, but they are protected end to end at the application layer using OSCOAP. The joint frames, the frames of the joint protocol. So the first update that we did is, uh, is regarding who initiates the security handshake, where we are using ad hoc from uh, yet to be determined the group. Uh, so basically, we went from left to the right uh, variant, and we removed one one exchange. Uh, at, in order to remove one exchange, we have the pledge now that is initiating the ad hoc uh, the ad hoc handshake, where JRC can respond with an optional act, which is defined in co-op as uh, meaning that uh, okay, hang on, I will respond to you later on in the process. Uh, and this can be useful in uh, in the use cases where are there, there, there are many concurrent requests uh, by multiple pledges on the JRC, and the JRC wants to alleviate the alleviate the the load that is on the network by signaling just to the pledge to to hang on and wait. Uh, this is of course optional with pre-shared keys and, and mandatory with asymmetric keys. The the handshake is. Uh, so right now, to come back to the initial point of how uh, uh, pledge or the joint proxy learns the JRC's address, as I uh, joint proxy essentially plays the role of a co-op proxy and statelessly forwards the requests and relays the responses back to the pledge. For this, we use uh, an option that is defined in co-op option that is defined in minimal security that we term stateless proxy option. And but the issue is how the joint proxy knows the IPv6 address of the JRC, and uh, thanks to Michael, uh, if I remember right, uh, we settled down for this approach where basically the 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 address of the JRC is returned in the joint response structure, 
such that uh, the pledge at the time of the joint pledge learns the, the address of the, the JRC. And we did an important optimization in the most uh, common use case, which is when, uh, uh, when JRC is co-located with the DAG root to uh, omit the, uh, to the, uh, the, the IPv6 address of the JRC in order and imply it from the DODAG ID. So basically when a pledge joins, uh, in order to fully complete the join process, it needs to receive a DIO with the DODAG ID, and then it configures the, the address of the JRC. And one assumption there is that the DAG root is pre-configured with the address uh, for the whole process to kick off. Uh, we had a discussion in the security design team about MTI algorithms uh, to support, and uh, in turn, we mostly discussed the symmetric part, and we, uh, we quite easily settled down for the CCM star equivalent in COSI. So this is ASCCM 1664-128. Uh, it has uh, eight byte authentication tag, and in terms of non-slanked, non uh, non it corresponds to the 15.4 uh, CCM, so that we can reuse the same hardware for uh, symmetric encryption on the application layer as we do for link layer security. In terms of hash, we set, uh, we in the draft currently we uh, mandate SHA-256, and in terms of asymmetric keys, we mandate the P-256 elliptic curve and ECDSA uh, signature algorithm. But this is prone to change. I would like to discuss this further at the, uh, maybe during the meeting if we want to support the 255-19 uh, curve, Edwards curve. Uh, if this would be useful, as uh, there were some discussions today in, in the ACE meeting about that. So let me come back to the implementation status. In the OpenWSN ecosystem, uh, we implemented uh, the minimal security with pre-shared keys, and we finished the implementations of uh, OSQAP in Python uh, and minimal security, the JRC part in Python, as well as the embedded part, uh, OSCOAP in C and minimal security O3 in C in what concerns pledge and the joint proxy. And the draft is fully implemented apart from the uh, asymmetric uh, variant. In, there is also an independent implementation ongoing in Contiki uh, that we try to test during the plot test. Uh, it is still incomplete, but it is, it is ongoing and uh, it will soon be completed. I'm, yes. So in terms of the implementation experience, uh, the, well, I found a couple of issues when trying to implement this. The first issue was regarding the packet size, and uh, the most critical was the join response that comes down from the uh, from the DAG root to the first hop into the into the network because of the source routing header and basically with this the, due to the join response payload if we assume no fragmentation in the network we are hitting the maximum limit of the network in terms of the depth that we can reach so this is so it's extremely important that we optimize this in order to build uh, deep networks and my my understanding is that wireless heart for the moment goes up to eight hops deep. I was able to test with six hop, uh, with five hops, uh, in the uh, with six hops, but from the nodes with, from the same manufacturer, which uh, you know, which compresses the source routing header quite uh, efficiently. So, uh, so sorry, uh, yes. some clarifying question. So, um, you're trying to measure how deep the network can be until the moment when you have to fragment, right? So there's no yes. hard limit. It's just yes. that starting at five, what did you say? Six yes. hops with man, same five hops, hops. Five hops. If you have seven hops, it will work, but you'll have to fragment yes, that's correct. The, 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 the packets. Okay. So assuming there's no fragmentation in my packet, I have, in yeah, in my packet, I have a source route, which, which lists the different uh, hops to go through, mm -hmm. followed by you know a bunch of headers, followed by the in encrypted OSCO app payload, right? Yes. Okay, and so is 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 there anything we can do to that? Or is so, next slide about that? Yes, I have the the next slide. I have the oh, okay. dissection, the packet dissection, basically with the join response. 
uh, in the case with five, five hops downwards. And as you can see, we have the source routing header at the beginning. And these are some modifications that I had to do in order to make it work. Uh, so I use the token length set to zero uh, in co-op, which, uh, which is allowed in co-op spec. Uh, uh, which is allowed in co-ops work in certain circumstances that uh, fit very well with the join process. Uh, I removed the content format option from the draft in my local copy. I still, this is still not present in O3. So the join response does not contain the content format option, but this is implied, I think, uh, uh, from the, in terms of pledge, because we are defining uh, the protocol on top. Yes? It, it does contain a URI? The, the join response does not. It contains the message ID. The message ID. The so message ID. So the pledge is able to match the, okay. yes. So it knows it, from that message ID that the content yes. format is kind of well known. Yes. Okay. So I think, and Pascal, I think is going to say something with routing here. I think that if we had DAO projections that we could shorten the routing header, header. Um, but you could tell me whether I'm wrong about that. And you said, do you think the routing header could be further compressed too? You just said, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so this is Pascal, and um, there are two venues that we can look at in order to make this a bit deeper without fragmentation. First one is is the way you allocate your addresses and the way you you build them and the way they are. Uh, because I see there that you seem to be using a six row arrange with is is that four octets that you use? In, Oh, so I did not implement six low RH, so I'm but, not, uh, yes, it's thankful. But yeah, it is, yeah. but the question is, you know, there are multiple ways to compress the address. What makes mm -hmm. them more compressible is if they share more bytes, you know, if everybody mm -hmm. builds on the same mm -hmm. thing. And the best way to have everybody build on the same thing is, is really linked to what you're doing. It's because if you if you have the short address, yeah, exactly. then you can derive, you can make sure, you know, they are unique along a path because if it's, if it's the root doing both, it yeah. does everything in its hand, right? Mm -hmm. So you can derive short address, every hop is two octets. And I don't think I'm seeing hops of two octets here. I don't know how to read what you write, but I, I think that you're using four octets per hop. And if you read your right stuff from the short address and you assign the short address so you know you're doing well, yeah. then you should be able to use a six row RH with two octets per hop. Okay. So, so that's one venue. The, the other venue is uh, as long as your network is not too big and that, that will that will it's a step in the future, but that's the point that Michael was making. Um, there is a, the draft in the making at raw, which is basically saying, okay, you're doing non-storing because you know we don't we know you don't have so much room, but actually, actually, um, I can shorten the source route headers by having just a little bit of state that the root decides to install into particular devices. So now it's not like an explosion of state because the root can maintain how much state it installs, but that you can really use that to have a little bit of storing, which again will shorten your, your source route path. And in part, well, you can decide where you place the state, etc. There will be a limit, Michael, because this thing spans as a tree, and at some point, you know, you don't have enough state, so you can't you can't shorten every pass to everybody. But that that can be a tool if if your network is not well balanced and you you have a direction where a lot of things go, then you can shorten, you know, this. And I'm thinking in particular in AMIM or use cases where you've got those long lines of meters along a street, and typically for that. The rod projection thing will save a lot, and then you can, you, without a fragment connection, you can authenticate all the meters along the street w without having a problem. Right. Yeah. So, so it's really. Yeah. So the good news is that this is orthogonal to the draft. I mean, this is showing the full dissection, but uh, it's orthogonal. Uh, what is not implemented in uh, the implementation in our implementation currently is the assignment of short addresses to the stack. So this will further save. But I think it's already good news that we can go down five hops. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Without without, fra without fragmentation. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Uh, just a clarifying question. I think we have to stop after that. Um, so the number, the five hubs that is assuming uh, EUI 64s are used in the source header. I understand you then elide them if the beginning is the same, but this is assuming EUI 64 64 bit addresses, right? Oh, on link layer. Yes. Link layer. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. So this will go down if we go yes. to two bytes. 
Okay. Yes, and this is another thing that we can improve. Basically, this is a dissection, seaboard dissection of the join response, seaboard decoding of the join response. And we are currently using uh, 26 bytes to encode a 16 byte key and one byte key ID. So uh, it's quite an overhead. And uh, one proposal would be to use a binary encoding to compress uh, the join response in something like what they did in OSCOOP with the uh, compressed COSI. So that would be one proposal that I would like to discuss also during the meeting. And the second issue that I find quite important is the joint proxy policy. And although I under, uh, understand that we, we will not standardize the policy in ITF, uh, there is a problem of how joint proxy accepts those uh, insecure layer two frames at the, during the joint process. Because in the implementation currently, I had to allow it from any node that I haven't seen before. And uh, this can be easily spoofed such that uh, an arbitrary node can inject packets into the network. So the proposal is to include, uh, to provide the mechanism uh, to accept insecure a layer two frames only upon a trigger. And I think this is where Michael's draft uh, fits very well uh, in terms of the flag, uh, in terms of uh, one flag that we will use to signal that the join process is allowed. So basically the idea would be for the final implementation that upon a, a button, to, uh, button press uh, in the beacon, we include the information element with the join process, uh, join process flag set that we can use to, uh, to accept insecure layer two frames and expire upon a timeout. Yes. Oh, Pascal, again, I think it's a very classical to have a few words in a draft like that, which, which says uh, throttle, like, uh, never accept uh, any quantity, any amount. Mm -hmm. Have and and so there's not necessarily a value, but but there is something which says, oh, any sensi sensible implementation will will have a mechanism to throttle the request. Mm -hmm. Just take as many per unit of time or yeah. mm -hmm. so. Okay. So one sentence you want it. Yeah. yeah. So okay. so I, I understand two two things. One at us at the sentence who's rather talks about throttle, just the name throttle. It's all already there, I believe. Okay. Sorry. And uh, and 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 have this mechanism to switch on and off basically the joint proxy oh. feature of the mode. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, so that would be it. So basically the PSK variant is quite stable and implementation ready, and we have the implementation in OpenWSN complete. Uh, we settled down for ad hoc roles uh, in the asymmetric variant, uh, but it, we have yet to implement this, and I will publish a 04 draft with implementation experience before what I hope to be the working group last call. And reviews are of course very welcome. Uh, a quick comment that uh, at the moment there are two drafts that are that we depend upon to have this work, and maybe Michael can comment a bit. But uh, there are debates at this moment, and there will be a, a lunch on Wednesday about whether uh, ad hoc in particular, and then there is a draft by Peter as well that that we need whether they they should have a home at the ATF and uh, whether the ATF will endorse that this work continue continues and obviously will be pushing for this thing to happen, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Michael. Any questions for Malisha? <coughs> thank you. And to finish the security, Michael. Hi. So, um, that's not the right side here. Interesting. Oh, they'll never work. Okay. In the end, so I have to look here. All right. So, um, try to get the mic in front of me. So, um, the goal is a zero touch join protocol, um, and it's um, supposed to look uh, very much like the Anna Mabruski work, but optimized for six tish and um, minimized, and we're using uh, methods and protocols that. We already have code space for. Um, so in news, um, the ANWR voucher document, which is the document that allows in zero touch to the uh, pledge to understand that this is in fact the network that it belongs to. These are in fact the droids you're looking for. Um, is um, 
is actually I, I said almost working group last call, but actually it, it it working group last call was over, and it was actually supposed to be um, done in parallel with this working group, and that was actually a mistake. Um, so uh, that's very good. Um, I I think it may take. Uh, it's been through, I think it may take a little while to get through the IESG, um, but I anticipate by the end of the summer, I think it probably will be out. So that's good for us. Um, the Anima Bruski document was rewritten in April, May, um, and you can come tomorrow and learn about that if you like. Um, but the key thing is that the, the, the structure of it is now stable. It's about 15 page short, pages shorter. Um, that's always good. Um, and our document, which parallels it now, has to be rewritten in that same style. Um, and so that's on my to-do list. Um, Michael, if you say come tomorrow, you mean the to anima. anima. Yeah, to Anima. Story. Yes, I'm sorry, to Anima. Yes. Um, so as Pascal mentioned, um, we need ad hoc. Um, ad hoc will be our, our asymmetric key management protocol um, that we need to run. Um, it... Uh, could go in ACE, it could go in other places, um, and some area directors are going to have lunch and they're going to figure out what's going on. And and so that's taken a fair number of cycles to convince people that there's a problem to be solved here, uh, both a problem of where the document goes and a problem that the document actually solves that we need. Um, so the next steps are essentially, as I said, to, to re rewriting um, uh, Bruski with with uh, um, with Sixtish in mind, there's already a document that we have already, but you know it it uh, essentially it's been it's been cut up into pieces and and pieces have gone elsewhere. I've gone into Sixtish minimal, have gone into other places, I've gone into Bruski and things like this. And so now it's time to rewrite a document that basically we actually can pass as opposed to just a collection of texts and ideas. Um, and essentially that's it. So um, let me see, does this work? Yeah. You can't see that remotely. So TLS becomes ad hoc, HTB becomes co-op, and the minimal security joiner request is, the, is, is bootstrapped with uh, the ad hoc protocol. Um, so when you read the documents, you should see essentially, you should be able to put the two documents next to each other and say, oh yes, so in Brewski for big equipment you do this, and for small equipment you do this, and there would be a kind of a one-to-one, -one, and that should be all just make everyone happy so that they can say, okay, it's essentially the same pro protocol conceptually, but on the wire the bits are, are much smaller and faster or slower. Yeah. So, huh? Small bits. Small bits. So bits. The bits are the same. The, the same number of bits, but they're smaller. Yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, and and I'd like to change. I'd like to change the document to to include the word zero touch in the title. And actually, I'd like to change the 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 internet draft name to include that as well. I think that will be simpler. But uh, that probably that may require the blessing of the chairs, or maybe they'll describe decide. The whole working group has to decide. But. Uh, so that's uh, what I would like to do is change the name of the document. Um, so related documents. So with some some things that as we were working on both six dish minimal and um, zero touch, um, we realized there were some things that were not specifically in, related to the security, but that the security needed. So the two of them are, um, we have one is this enhanced beacon document. And so this is an additional information element which we can now allocate care of uh, that RFC that you announced at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and so we can put some additional information in the beacon. Um, so the specific things that um, we needed to, we wanted to put in was, um, essentially there's a bit that says, I am a join proxy, okay? Um, and there's another bit that says, I'm a router. So, which means, please don't, send a, if you are a leaf node, not a routing node, please don't send a uh, router solicitation eating up a multicast so uh, slot. You can unicast one to me and I'll answer you, okay? And that saves a lot of, you know, multicast broadcast slots are, are, are pretty, uh, pretty precious and we don't really want to use them up for stuff. We have to use them for DIOs. Um, and so, the, the, the specific enhancement that the join part was in fact a preference, you know, how, how willing am I to, to allow uh, pledges to join? And so the suggestion is essentially is that if there's a, a maximum number 255, then it means I'm not willing to have proxies join. 
And as a result, if you propagate this through the beacon from the dodag down, if the dodag happens to say 255, then if the root says that, then everyone else is going to have to say, well, obviously the dodag doesn't want anyone joining, so none of the rest of us should let anyone join. And so in effect, the, do the, the uh, ripple root can turn off uh, join processing um, through the thing. Is it a good idea or not? No. Seems like a good work for me. Um, such information could also be in the Ripple DIO as another possibility. Ripple DIOs don't necessarily propagate as, as often. Um, uh, sort of a Michael, sort of a mix. Yes. If I'm a new joining node, I I don't understand the DIOs. They're if, if you're an, if you're a pledge, you don't hear this at all. Well, you don't sorry, hear. Sorry, sorry. If you're a pledge, you hear this. Yes. But not DIOs. Yes, but the point is, we could turn off the announcement of this bit. Is what Militia wants to do. We could do that in DIOs. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. But the point is that that it could also be done by the fact that that all of the nodes, all of the the routing nodes from the root down are also sending beacons regularly, right? And so this could also be transmitted that way. Pascal, I I, I love the idea. I think we need a, a quick draft at row, which will say, oh, basically the root is a uh, JRC, and uh, here is its preference. And then as you propagate this new uh, option in the DIO, the 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 nodes can only uh, reduce the value that, that you find in that bit. Well, uh, well, so, you, so you'd rather do it in a DIO rather than in a beacon? Oh, yeah, because you, yeah. it has to be, because it's linked to the root. Okay. It, it is a property what? of the root, and then it's a property of the sub-DAG to be able to use that root as a GRC in the first place, right? Yeah. We've got this compression, which is more efficient if the root is a GRC. You need to know that. Somebody has to signal it, and it can only be the root. Okay. At some point, we secure those things, and the root will securely say, I am a GRC, I'm not a GRC. It belongs to what the root exposes and what to the, de the device is uh, for. Now, if you want to be able to announce part of that to the joining node, yes, you take it from the DIO as, as a proxy, you have that, and you expose that on the lower layer, but but you need to get it from Ripple. So, okay. yes, we, so you're we, suggesting we get it from the in, the on-off from Ripple rather than... It's more than an on-off, right? It it's a preference. It's, it's, it's a preference. Yeah, so, it's a so preference. When it's off yeah. when to be well, well, originally, originally, we also were not believing that the preferences were necessarily decreasing as mm -hmm. you got away from the re root. It does not necessarily, but it cannot augment. Perhaps, so, 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 so the, the, the scenario is that, that I had envisioned is where you had some, uh, a diagram would help here, where you had some uh, dense intermediate uh, a bunch of, of, of mesh, okay? Where there was quite a number, let's say two, two, two ranks down, there's quite a number of, of devices. And the device says, look, I can hear six other beacons willing to do pro join proxy. My battery's low, I'm not gonna announce, okay? Because, I can hear that there's other other will other willing participants who have obviously higher more battery. So my battery's too low. I'm not going to help. Well, that's another okay. process procedure. You right. can you can dis well, describe well, it as well. Use trickle and all those things and and put a weight on trickle, which is based on your battery. So, so to get but, but what would he announce? What would that node announce downwards? Well, th what you announce on the DIO and what you and what announce. you announce on your beacon are orthogonal, right? They're orthogonal. Yes, I agree. So, so maybe the, 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 what you're saying is that the, the ripple value cannot increase, cannot but increase. that the, but that and locally you can decide to make your, your Anything enhanced beacon value much, much lower, uh, or, or well, less, bigger, less actually, preference, you, bre yes, yes, you much it, bigger sure than you actually announce. Yeah. So we've decided we should be consistent with the other. Please. I mean, if you can, I would, I would really use zero as no, because it's false. I, okay. And, Increasing it makes oh better. I mean, uh, it's always this game of which is bad and which is good. Right. Well, I think we should make it consistent with some other with well rank gets big when bigger ranks are are worse. So I think we should make it consistent with that. So Thomas, uh, yes, uh, the joint priority increase increases. A, a higher joint priority uh, actually means less priority. Right. So a higher number is less priority. I, I think, you know, the joint proxy is a, and, and this is my personal opinion, huh? that's why I'm here. So the joint proxy feature is a 1540 TSCH feature. So I, I, I don't see why we should start mingling this with Ripple and whatnot. I mean, I can run a 54 network, 1540 TSCH network without Ripple and, and you know, why, why are we 
doing this like across everything. So so propagate this on off. <laughs> <laughs> we should, we can talk as well. <laughs> yes, we we we'll have to end that on the mailing list because it's a fantastic topic actually. Okay. But but it's it's mostly I mean basically there there is the the, the network view of it, and then the the layer two view of it. So yes, we keep them independent, but for instance, like, like just the ability to turn it on off kind of makes sense at, at the global DODAG level, right? Because the GRC wants to be a GRC or not, or, or it's busy at this time and, and it wants to come back. And, and for instance, there are just too many things coming in from that particular network to want to throttle it. I don't know, maybe you, you link, for instance, the, the preference with, with kind of the throttling level. So if, by pushing new DIOs and the lower preferences, you will ask the, the distributed proxies to throttle more. And there's a lot of things you can do if you signal through Ripple how to do it. But that's the Ripple level, that's a layer three global level. And then at the local level, the node can take a decision of doing even less, but it cannot take a, 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 a decision of doing more. You see? It's, it's, it's not the same. We the could network, name them the differently. It's not support. exactly the same field we're talking about. The, the network won't support more, so that's the point. The, the, the node can, can use up to the amount, the network, whatever the units will be um, there. Go ahead. This is Malisha. So I would just like to state that I agree with the layer two view because the, the problem with the, uh, the implementation was only how to configure the exempt flag in 802.15.4. So basically when to accept insecure packets at layer two and everything else is taken care of by the IPv6 forwarding and uh, the, the joint protocol. So I would rather do it very simply with the enhanced beak, with the flag, depending only locally on the, the joint proxy. Okay. The proposal is not to remove that. The proposal is to say, hey, uh, if, if you want to propagate something about a more global knowledge, then, then we need a way to do it as well. For instance, the way you throttle, you just discussed, okay, there is some, some blind throttling to happen. Well, maybe the level of throttling depends on network-wide metrics, like how many people are trying to join at this time. So each GN should throttle more because too many people are coming in. And that's not something that uh, an individual layer two can know. And the one thing I really oppose is that you learn something from your parent at layer two because you don't know in which direction it propagates. You need to learn it from your layer three parent, just like we do for time. Yeah, that may be a really good point. You need to learn it from your layer three parent. Um, so from a um, process point of view, I believe, following the IANA considerations in 6550, we can allocate new Ripple uh, DIO options. That's not a problem. Um, we don't have to go to roll to do that. Um, the question is, should we do it in this document, which is defining a layer two object? Should we define a layer three object at the same time? Because we're still defining the extensions to these hands beacon for the pledge to listen to, right? That, that's fun because um, that's a bit like the Pascal again. The the question we have about what's coming up for six stop, right? At some point we may end off six stop to IEEE, okay. and if this document is a single document, then ending off alphabet will, will be a lot more complicated, right? But so, um, so you'd like two documents? Well, I'm just no, I didn't say that. I just I just put one one of the possible problems on the table. I'm not to, to, for those viewing at home, Thomas has just pulled out a really large bottle of cola. He anticipates a long conversation now. <laughs> uh, so, so, like, um, I have no particular preference either way, but like, we can do it um, both ways if both of them are possible. So, if you want to do it in one document, and we can probably do a joint last call and uh, here and roll. Like, Ines is like here past that pillar. Not see her, but I know she's there. <laughs> we don't even have to do that. We, we, yeah, so, yeah. I, I'm not worried about that process. I, I, I'm worried about what the, 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 you know, about handing off or whatever. So the other point is that this document has not been adopted. Yeah, yeah. So it would be good to adopt it as it is. And then if you want, we want to have a tell, I will write us another document that talks about the layer three option. Okay. And then if, if you want to make it at one document that, yeah. you know, so I, I I'd like, um, we cannot adopt right now, but I'd like to get a feel from the room uh, about uh, whether you think it's a good idea, whether you think it's not a good idea. So those who think, from, from the, this draft, excuse, this draft, 
this draft. This draft. The, the draft uh, join uh, enhanced about beacon. enhanced beacon join enhanced to beacon. tell yeah. proxies you exist. So who uh, thinks, pledges that proxies exist? So who who read the draft? <laughs> we have uh, over there behind the pillar. Yeah, a uh, little maybe ten people, a little less than ten people, eight people. Okay. So who thinks it's a bright idea that we should? Uh, among those who read it, who objects? <laughs> no, right? The idea is clear. So could we have maybe? Show hands. Well, tweet. Yeah. Okay. So who 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 thinks adopting this uh, this draft within the working group is a good idea? Please raise your hand now. Who opposes to the idea of adopting this work document within the work group? Please raise your hand now. Okay, so the same people who read it raise their hands, and uh, we did not have behind the pillars to abstain. Oh, I don't, I don't see behind the yeah. pillars. I don't have the eyes. Um, but uh, was somebody behind the pillar raising their hand for the no question? No. Okay, there are no so, hands up. So there's no hands up for no. Okay, that, that's, that's inter perfect. important yeah. information for us. Thank you. So we'll confirm for the meeting. Thank you, Michael. Okay, okay so I have. Yeah. Well, I let's write the I document and then and then you can see what it says, okay? Because I think that'll be two pages to start. Um, so the other document that came out of or was removed from the um, the, the zero touch and one touch document was rekeying, okay? Um, what does it say on my slide? Um, so this is intended to be a Comey based thing, leveraging uh, a key that was set up ideally through um, through the OS co-op used for, um, or a, so, sorry, leveraging the key set up either through ad hoc or the existing keys that were one touch, okay? So that there's no additional key management overhead that's happening this way. How that works is, remains to be determined. Um, so basically it is, you know, you have your network wide key, um, you have a key ID for it, one, okay? Um, I believe we have in minimal, we have eliminated key one, key two. I can't remember if we did. This is malicious. It's not specified. So we leave the possibility to, to return multiple keys multiple in the joint keys. response. Right. So, so, yeah. so the, the, there's, if we, whenever we, re, we have to return two key IDs. So you have key one and key two that may be, sorry, ID one and ID two that responds to, um, six tish minimals, key one, key two. K1, K2, and then we have to rekey them, which involves giving everyone a new set of keys. And then um, when the Dodag root believes, the JRC believes that it has communicated with um, enough nodes, preferably all of them, but maybe there's some that just, they don't exist anymore. It's given up on them. At which point it starts using the new keys. And when it starts using the new keys, that's a signal to all other nodes that have the new keys to stop using the old keys. So we have a basically a, a, a rolling uh, rekey um, there. So first of all, the first step is that everyone gets a new key, and then the next step is that we use it. And actually, the third kind of step is we tell it to, them to delete the old keys, but actually put a timer on that. So this is all intended to be essentially Comey based, um, which is uh, simple management over co-app as the based on a Yang model. It's relatively small and simple in terms of bytes used. Um, and that's a second document. So Peter and I uh, have done some work on that. Um, more work needs to be done. I don't think either of us have looked at the document since the last ITF. Um, maybe Peter has. I, I don't remember. I, I have I have heard that that the situation, you know, this working group tried to use Comey for 6P, and we weren't very happy with it at the time. And that it has gone in the last four years, it's gone through a significant change, and it's much, much easier and smaller to deal with. And so that's a good thing. And it's probably the right answer from a IETF wide, you know, what are we doing uh, with management kind of thing. Why would you need to rekey? Well, either because you actually care about crypto hygiene and want to recycle your keys now and then, or B, because there's some node in your network which has gone bad. And the only way you have of cutting them off from your network is to change everyone else's key. So that's the, the oh shit. I need to move move I need to get rid of of uh, Maller from my network okay so that's pretty important but 
Um, rekeying is going to take recognize that rekeying means talking to every single node um, with at least a couple packets and getting a response from them. And you can do it slowly. It could happen over hours or even days, depending on the bit rate of your network. Um, but that the slower you do it, the longer you have a bad guy on your network. Okay, so that's the, the the caveat. There's no the document doesn't say how fast to do it. That's up to that's going to be you know quality of implementation or something like that to do it. So that's this document. Uh, so we're completely out of time. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought this was earlier in the document. Oh well, that's good. <clears throat> um, so that's a second document. Um, please read it. If you think that it belongs in this working group, then I would love to have a mailing list discussion about that. Yeah, I, I see. And who's Shavi? No, Simon. Simon. Uh, so thank, thank you, thank you, Mike, for this. So, um, we're no more questions for Michael. Okay, so now we're entering in the last. Uh, we're right on time because uh, we we're, we jumped one ten minute thing. Uh, so we're right on time. We're now entering the if time permits uh, and time permits uh, section. We have four new work. Uh, that is the first time I believe that they're being presented. Um, so Simon has a, a scheduling function called ASF. Yep. Four zeros. Thank you. So so yeah, sorry. Um, w w one thing that's important. Please keep your time. Uh, you, you have ten minutes. Sure. Thanks. So it's switching back to the scheduling topic here. Um, what we are proposing is a scheduling function called ASF, uh, which stands for Autonomous Scheduling Function, uh, where you have two main concepts. The first one is that the, you have autonomous slot frames or slot frames with autonomous cells in them, which means that in the slot frame you have cells that are self-maintained uh, locally by the node, uh, only by the knowledge of the neighborhood. Uh, so the basic idea there is that the as a node, you know your neighborhood and you know the MAC addresses of your neighbors. And you're going to use the MAC address and to hash it to actually find out a slot and channel offset uh, deterministically to, to communicate with that node. Um, the second concept in ASF is that you have one slot frame per traffic plane, um, typically one for the TISH synchronization, uh, one for the routing control, one for the application, but you could have arbitrary as many as you want. Um, and uh, each, so one benefit of that is that this, so these slot frames are uh, isolated completely uh, by design. Um, so they don't interact with one another. And the slot frame length is going to dimension your schedule like in any slot frame. But uh, the, the key design point here is that because you have one slot frame per traffic plane, you can very easily dimension uh, the traffic capacity for each plane. Um, the applications of that are mostly distributed routing networks. So networks, so everything takes place fully distributed, like in a Ripple network. And we have very extensive uh, experimentation of this ASF in testbed with over 200 experiments in three different testbeds, ranging from 25 to 380 nodes. And we demonstrate up to five nines reliability in that context with Ripple, both storing and non-storing mode, upward and downward uh, traffic. Now, this comes obviously with major limitations, which I wanted to highlight here. Um, is that it's highly suboptimal um, for a few reasons. The three main reasons are uh, on the slide. Number one, the cells are not cascaded along the path. You cannot do very quick forwarding, um, A to B followed by B to B to C, et cetera. The slots are all shared. We don't have dedicated slots. And the schedule is always provisioned for the worst case. Uh, so you're going to be either, you have to choose between energy efficiency and capacity. Uh, you cannot dynamically add more uh, cells for traffic between A and B if suddenly you need more traffic between A and B. I'm going to show here a brief overview of each of the three different types of slot frames. We have three types. The first one, the simplest one, is uh, absolutely equivalent to the 60-ish minimal. Um, so you basically have a slot frame here. Um, and here you have, a, in that case, you have a single slot, which is used for reception transmission. It's a shared slot. Uh, and all nodes, that's a rendezvous slot. So all the nodes are waking up at the same time, same channel offset. 
and this is used typically for neighbor discovery. It's used for any broadcast uh, communication with node you do not know yet. Um, so it's it's used most often at the default slot frame uh, and for routing control, etc. Um, here on the slide, you see only four channel offsets. So the one one thing here is that for each of the slot frame we have in ASF, we actually de uh, dedicate a subset of the 16 or or the n available slot for, um, channel offsets. So here in that example, we have a that that slot frame has four channel offset to play with. The second one is the receiver-based slot frame, in, uh, which is used for unicast communication. In that one, the nodes maintain well; they have one static receive. That's why it's called the receiver base. They have one static receive slot here, the green one, uh, at a channel offset and time offset based on the hash of the of the MAC address of the node. And then for each neighbor, which is known by the AT6 neighbor cache, for each neighbor you compute the the hash of the MAC, and that gives you coordinates in X and Y. Uh, for a transmit shared slot to that neighbor. Uh, it's a shared slot because uh, you have multiple senders to the same neighbor and also because you might have multiple uh, nodes listening on the same because the hash is not collision free. Huh? The last one is a sender based slot frame, the exact same thing except that now the cell that is fixed is for sending. So you have always one cell uh, based on the hash of your own MAC address. Um, and then you maintain receive cells uh, for the other nodes that you want to to listen to, um, and that is typically used for privileged neighbors such as the teach time source or Ripple parent, uh, because it gets more costly. If if you do it, you can you could also choose to do it for all neighbors. It gets more costly because then you need to listen to all neighbors. It's a little more costly in energy. How this is all put together, that so as I was saying before, you have one slot frame per traffic plane. Each slot frame has diff, uh, different subsets of channel offset, and that's a way to isolate. Uh, and the slot frames have each different size, and we recommend the size to be co-prime, so that when they repeat, they do so independently. And the slots are going to overlap every now and then, but they do it in a uniformly distributed way. Uh, when that happens, the I triple precedence rule for slots is actually uh, used, uh, meaning TX is uh, uh, has higher priority than RX, and a smaller slot frame handle has higher priority. This is started of the draft, so we have a description of different slot frame types. We have a definition of how the coordinates of the cells are computed. We have an example schedule of the, uh, with four slot frames. Uh, we have definition of all the configuration parameters. You want to take the question now? I, I was on the previous slide, so I can write if you prefer. Yeah, I mean, it's um, almost last. Uh, Go ahead. There's, well, there is this habit to use different slot frames, Pascal Tuber, for different priorities. I was just wondering, since you're making different slot frames, is if you keep them all aligned time-wise, or if because there is this risk, risk of a collision. So at some point, you would say, hey, what if I could use some CSMA in there? And I was just wondering if, since you have so many of them, you can't really use them as a priority now. They kind of, most of them are the same priority, like traffic. But some of them may still be higher priority, like, like uh, the time. And you may be thinking, oh, those which are higher priority, I may synchronize them a, a bit ahead of time, like two milliseconds before the lower one. So if there is, you, you can still do some form of CSMA. I'm just Right. Now you get this possibility, right? I'm just asking if you're using it. I'm not sure it's possible to do that in compliance with HEEE 154E, though. Well, different slot because frames. About, like, minor desynchronization of the slot frames, right? Which is... Uh, Can you have different slot frames which are not synchronized? Yeah, I, I think Pascal means different slot frames, same slot structure, yeah. but just slot frames of different lengths that are... Well, no, no, they, they start, I mean, if you, if you, if you have, like, time. an epoch, Right. Um, don't use well. I have, I have different epochs, which which are shifted by like two milliseconds for different slot frames. Not possible. No. You cannot do that. No. Oh. They would be they, independent networks. The slots are aligned. Well, they are mostly right. Yes. You, yeah. So do that beyond independent networks. Uh, yeah, but that becomes the point the being, you know, to implement, huh? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just the same for everything. Just shifted by two milliseconds, so that the high priority is always though. there first, and you can always detect it. Mm. I mean, it's just. Mm. But on the other hand, we also have different channel offset for each slot frame. So whenever you start listening, you actually are on one particular channel. 
so you will not start hearing from from one that starts a bit earlier on you, you you will like you know when you start receiving which one you're actually listening at anyway but but you have collisions right even and, and there is no no thing which will make a higher priority transmission have a better chance than the lower priority you no, don't have an 11e or anything you like have that. are between transmission in the same slot frame because all the slot frames here must have different channel offset meaning they will never land on the same physical channel at one particular point in time but but you might have a mode might have multiple things to do at one given point in time yes. in which case IEEE precedence exactly. uh, takes over yeah yeah so the only collision you have is a schedule level collision it's yeah the thing which is right. the prime number and yeah, yeah exactly yeah it's really there's nothing which protects the area priority which protects the area priority like if, any, yeah, right. if there is a ripple tide and the transition yeah. and the prime numbers are bad luck this day mm -hmm. then but the highest priority is going to be alone. It, it takes precedence, so it's going to be the only one transmitting at, at that time. The transmitter the, knows. The soft frame has a handle, and these specify the priority. So, yes, so. I have an NT and CND, they're near. ANT doesn't know. I, yeah, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that works, and, and I propose to do You this guys are not talking about the same collisions. Pascal is talking about collision on the radio between nodes, and you're talking about collisions between schedules on the same node. Mm. You're having a dis disconnected okay. discussion. OK. This was Dominique. <laughs> Thank you, Dominique. We are uncollisioning signal. Yeah. But so uh, a question, so thank you for... I think the second is... last slide. So, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, so we have a definition of configuration parameters. One thing that's not defined yet is how to distribute, the, how to discover that configuration. Um, there are two options. Um, the preferred one currently would be to have a new information element in the EB. So because it's a joint time thing. So as you join the network, you should know which slot frames you're going to have and how to maintain them. So here, what I mean is the rules that tell you what are the lengths of slot frame, which which cells are uh, receiver base, sender base, which one does, has a rendezvous, etc. The other option is to do it with 6p commands. Yeah, overloading. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, this is just a feedback slide. Uh, so if you have feedback on any of those, on the design itself, and what the draft should cover, um, how to discover configuration, and so on. So I have a, a single question. Has this been evaluated? Yeah, it's been evaluated uh, experimentally with like many experiments, uh, three different test beds, up to 380 nodes, five nodes reliability with repo. OK. Any questions? Thank you. Thanks for staying in time. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Next on <laughs> is uh, Jonathan on six issue examples. Hello, uh, I'd like to talk about these 60 examples. Um, this draft was, but well, this document was written like two years ago, then the protocols have evolved, some other protocols have appeared, so we needed to update this document. The goal of this um, document is just to provide a, a reference for new implementers to like how a 60 frame should look like. So here we see different six-stitch frames in this document. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, in order to, to write this document, we have we use two tools. We use OpenWSM project using uh, the OpenWSM firmware and also the OpenWSM visualizer as a simulation, and also using Wireshark, the latest uh, release which implements uh, six lower range dissection and six top dissection as well. Here we see the, the topology of the simulating node. So we use three nodes in simulation, being node one, the dark root, node two being the, sh the child of node one, and node two being the parent of node three. So once the network is formed, Warsha will capture every single um, frame change between, between the nodes. Here's the table of contents of this document. So here we see all the all the examples of the frames of six stitch. So if you see here, we have enhanced beacons, RPL, DAO, and DIO, and 
acknowledge frames, we have ICM PV6, echo request and reply, and all the six speak commands. Uh, well, uh, now I'd like to give you just a small example of one frame which was in this document. So it's node one being node three. So here, so here we see node one uh, destination. Uh, mm -hmm. to node one ping node three through node number two. So here we see destination is, well, number uh, node two in the frame layer. We see node one in the source, la in the, in the uh, source. And then we see here the destination is well, node three. So here node two passes the, the frame to node three and then just the reply. The reply going for three to two, and then the reply going for two to one. Well, this is a very simple draft of yeah all the all the sixty frames. Next steps. Um, this week we'll deliver a, a version number three with uh, including one CSP command list we was missing, and uh, we we did some editorial changes. Anyways, um, um, what's next? Uh, is this document really useful for new implementers uh, today for to them to have a reference? Um, if it's worth it to be adopted as a working group. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, I, I want to add a couple of points here for this draft. Uh, this is indeed a copy-paste exercise of a wireless out, Wireshark output. Agreed. But our experience has been we've we you published this a uh, couple of two, last couple of ITFs ago. It was used extensively at uh, plug tests. It was then kind of forgotten. We didn't update it. It disappeared. And at the new plug test, we had again the same questions: How does this header fit with this? What's this bit with this byte? And I'm I'm uh, you know I I I like the fact that it shows on paper exactly how the headers fit one after the other and how exactly does six law rage fit with you know that kind of stuff so so um um you know in, in my mind this is this is definitely informational uh but this is something that we could contemplate as as adopting as a as a work group uh document actually suresh uh this is a case where i'd really like to have your advice so this is a very useful document for the implementer it will sh sh should we progress that all the way to rfc or is it something that the working group should keep maintaining what kind of form is the recommended practice for a document like this uh, so, so so personally right like i i'll leave it up to you for a minute okay but like i'll tell you what guideline i'm using myself okay when i'm talking about this uh, do you think this will be useful in five years after it's published? Okay, so that's the kind of like how I judge whether something would be useful or not. If you think it is, go ahead with it. If you think it's not, like keep it as a wiki. Or if you think it's going to be out there the day it's going to be published, don't bother, right? Like so, and I don't want to judge that for you, but that's the kind of guideline I'm going to use, like because I wrote that statement along with some of the other ADs about the support document. So I kind of want to follow like some kind of consistent guidelines because we see like all kind of things because there's some working groups that got chartered like long time ago which actually charter items saying these kind of things so we're having some uh, difficulty like applying like the same guidelines so uh, if you want to have a new deliverable for this right, that's what i'm going to apply so i'm saying okay is there archival value for this mm -hmm. if not no don't do it as a separate document put it in an appendix of something or or wiki or whatever or a draft that's maintained you decide okay okay thank you Okay, I have another one for Michael, very short. Um, there is the use of Ripple Info document. Um, would that make sense to, to have some, some, something like that as annex, just to show what's going on in those packets? You're asking, would the use of Ripple um, Info benefit from having this text at the end of it? Yes, as an annex, at least for the, for the cases that we present, some examples. Just that would really be awesome. And it would also, um, um, to address what Suresh said, it would it would also document the situation 
as of now, as of that document, which is a standards track document, and would be useful in five years when somebody goes to implement something that needs to be compatible with what's with what's deployed. Um, and so even if we do things after that, they would be saying, I am compliant to this particular use of Ripple document in my data plane. And here's some example packets that you can test with, right? So that actually would be awesome. Just we need to make we need to make sure that we've got the the relationship between there and that if there's if there's a bunch of six tish stuff there, that it's clearly this is layer two. So if you're not six tish, don't do this. Mm -hmm. Find some other yeah. other thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I th I it would be Thank cool. We're out of time. Th Thank you. Georges? Can you can you strictly st stick to the five minutes? Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is George George Papadopoulos, and I'm presenting the uh, draft about requirements that I wrote uh, along with Nicola Montavo and Pascal Tuber about packet replication and elimination in complex tracks in Sixtish. So Sixtish uh, networks. It's not uh, should not be only reliable but deterministic as well, meaning that the data packet that is transmitted need to be uh, transmitted in predefined and constant delay, right? So meaning that we should exhibit ultra low G the performance. So assuming that we have uh, wireless topology, SSS source, this destination, and the two relays here, we may implement what's called promiscuous overhearing uh, to do so, assuming that considering that we have uh, the wireless medium, which is by nature a broadcast, then any neighbor may overhear this transmission, right? So here, what I would like to pay attention is that in such scenario, we may have a scheduler where a cell where we are, where we are having a couple of uh, multiple receivers, and this need to be uh, addressed. And in addition to, we may have collisions at the acknowledgement, right? Next, uh, if we want to increase uh, the um, if we want to reduce the uh, the the, the GDA performance, we may employ the packet duplication, where each uh, 60 uh, node will transmit each data packet first to its default parent from the ripple and what we call here the alternative parent to increase the uh, reliability and to reduce the GDA performance. This transmission will take place in two different unicast while they may be overhearing. Here we need to pay attention on the uh, Ripple DIO message that potentially will need to be extended to allow so that each 60s node to have some uh, additional information about their potential parents and list of parents because we may need to have what's what we call here alternative parent. Next, uh, by employing uh, packet replication, it's straightforward that we are having uh, duplication. So the uh, the, we have unnecessary uh, traffic in the network. We, we need to uh, employ what's called packet elimination to reduce this unnecessary traffic. To do so, each 60s node, once it receives the first copy, of the, first copy of, of the data packet, it will discard the following copies. Here, uh, as per the 60s architecture, the sequence number is not, um, the 60s architecture uh, does not take position about how the sequence packet uh, are tagged in a packet. However, it comes with tagging packets for flow identification, which would be great to uh, efficiently apply in this procedure of packet elimination. Here I have uh, a simple example for you guys to see how it looks like the TSH schedule. Here I have the uh, a cell where I'm having the source transmits the data packet, and then I'm having the two receivers. So we have things to toggle with, with multiple receivers, the acknowledgement for the, uh, uh, from two different guys, so we need to avoid this collision. So whether we need, to, we need to discuss whether we are going to have one acknowledgement, two acknowledgement, or no acknowledgement. And then another thing that I want to point out here is how S is going to request from both, uh, from both destinations this, uh, this cell. So this is another thing that we need to be discussed uh, if we want, if, it's, if this uh, packet replication elimination procedure is interesting. Here is a summary of some of the requirements that I wrote in the draft that is related with the alternative parent selection. So we are going to talk about Ripple DIO message that may imply, that may add some additional information, the promiscuous overhearing. Again, we are having the um, 
the reservation for two destinations, like to transmit the packet to two different uh, destinations, how to request this cell, the uh, acknowledge the collision, how to avoid the collision at this acknowledgement, because we're having two destinations that are going to acknowledge the same transmitter, and then how to perform this packet elimination by employing tagging packet flow identification efficiently. Uh, what I want here is if somebody is uh, willing to review this draft, um, yeah, this is the last last slide, basically. Um, Please. I'm, I'm sure that I'm having some missed requirements, so I will be glad if I will get this uh, this feedback from you guys. Thanks so much. So please raise your hand if you're willing to read and review this draft. All right, so you have at least uh, two volunteer, three volunteers, four volunteers. Four. That's good. And then there's I see a hand there only, so that's five volunteers. Thank you. So that should be a good. Alex. <coughs> Thank you. So, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid that we're also out of time for the last presentation. Sorry, Lijo. I, I understand it. I mean, you already presented this at the interim meeting. I'm happy to continue discussing this draft at a follow-up interim meeting or on the mailing list, but we're running out of time. Sorry. This draft, yeah. And uh, we're 30 seconds towards the end. I think, Marita, you wanted to say something really, really quickly? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you. So I just want to let you know that at 6 p.m. I will be talking about an ongoing project founded by ESA where we are looking at how to integrate the IoT network with satellite connection. If you are interested, I will be happy if you join. It is in Paris room. And uh, I will show to you what we have done so far and the preliminary results that uh, we have. I think the event was announced uh, on some many lists already, so I will be happy if you join. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Rita. And uh, also, uh, please be aware that Bob Ailey, who is leaving now, um, has sent us some slides about the status of the IEEE activity on 802.15 and 15.4 in particular. And we have no time to present them, but we'll be adding them on the data tracker with the slides of this meeting, so you'll be free to go ahead and see them. Thanks, Bob, for the slides. And with this, I'd like to close the meeting. Thank you very much.